Okay, um, as, oh, uh, an announcement, uh, there are a substantial quantity of oranges, which Carlos tells me are free for the taking, so don't anybody go home with a shortage of oranges, uh, when there's such a bounty right here. Okay, we are wrapping up our consideration of the Nicene Creed, and today what we want to do is we want to compare the Apostles' Creed to the Nicene Creed. There's a handout here with the two creeds printed in parallel, if anybody needs to look at that, to find out a little bit more about it. And what's the point of this? Well, the point is that by comparing and contrasting them, you can see more clearly what each one specifically contributes what are the strengths of one, what are the strengths of the other. Now, one note here, um, I took these from the way they appear on the back of our bulletins, um, and there's one change that's very widespread in the West, at least, and certainly among the forms I consulted, but the way that the Nicene Creed originally read was not, I believe, Rather, it was, we believe, and so throughout, you know, when you say, and we believe in the Holy Spirit, and we believe in the Holy Catholic, we acknowledge, we look for, etc. So, in a sense, that's the first difference between the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. The Apostles' Creed says, I believe. The Nicene Creed says, we believe. Now, the way we recite them, we've turned them both into I, but after doing more historical research, I think on the bulletin, I'm going to turn that I back into a we for the Nicene Creed. What difference does that make, really? Well, maybe it doesn't make a whole lot of difference, but it's useful to see that because there are two different elements in our confession of faith that ought to be highlighted. One is the element of personal appropriation. And the other is the element of corporate agreement. When you say, I believe, as you do when you recite the Apostles' Creed, part of what you're communicating to that is, yes, this is what the church teaches, but not just that. I actually agree with it. I actually hold to these doctrines. This language may be old and different and coming from a different time and place, but it expresses what I understand Scripture teach. It is my confession, as well as the church's confession. In a time and in a society as idiosyncratic as ours, where people are encouraged to be unique just like everyone else, that idea of taking over a confession and making it your own may seem very odd. Um, you know, lots of people, for instance, these days want to customize their wedding vows and they want to make everything unique and different and reflect them instead of sticking with the old language that has served well for a long time. Well, regardless of whatever happens with wedding vows, when it comes to the faith, I hope you're not believing new things. I hope you're not believing things that nobody's ever believed before. I believe. And I also hope that it's not just you're saying, yes, my church teaches this. Certainly that's part of it. But do you, in your own personal individuality, believe it? I believe. We should all be able to say that. Well, what's the difference then between this we believe? Well, in I believe, you're saying this is my faith. I agree. I accept it. In we believe, between you and other people, between us and the rest of the church. What is it that Christians believe? We believe. Now, the very existence of a creed is sort of unusual. Not all religions have a creed. Ours does. Judaism, some forms of Judaism have a creed. Some forms of Judaism have a sort of creed. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet very small creed, but it is a creed of a kind. But not all religions have a creed. And it expresses the tremendous importance of doctrine for Christianity. You can't be a right kind.
kind, decent person, good neighbor, not believe the priest, and be a Christian. Belief is essential. And sometimes people who are in the world don't get that. They're really surprised by that. Something recently where a registered with him before that Christians actually believe that you have to believe in the supernatural that you have to believe in God that you have and he was very thrown by that because his whole background it didn't matter what your opinions were it only mattered what you did well the creed that's not true it does matter what you believe there are questions of faith okay Not that there's any difference, really, just that the Nicene Creed expands a little bit on the overall conception. Obviously, the Apostles' Creed doesn't believe in multiple gods, and yet it doesn't specify the word of one. So there's a characteristic difference between the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed is longer because it's more detailed and it's more precise. Okay, second section there, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord. Again, it says, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. And there, I think, the Nicene Creed is adding in one Lord under the pressure of that passage we looked at last week, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, where Paul talks about how for us there is one God and one Lord, Jesus Christ. I think that's why the word one occurs in both articles there. And then you notice that the Nicene Creed has a bunch of stuff that's not in the Apostles' Creed. Begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being in one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. None of that appears in the Apostles' Creed. Why? Well, that's the whole history of the Council of Nicaea that we've been looking at. It's called in response to Arianism. All of those phrases are anti-Arian phrases. They're defending the truth about Christ from an attack. An attack that wasn't envisioned when the precursor of the Apostles' Creed, the old Roman baptismal creed, was developed. So again, the Nicene Creed is not contradicting, but it's now, it's not a contradicting the Apostles' Creed, but it's asserting the same truth with a lot more elaboration and detail over against the heretics who were denying these things. And we looked at the meaning of these clauses previously, um, how it talks about its many different ways of asserting that Jesus is truly God, because he's begotten of the Father before all worlds. He's God of God. He's light of light. He's true God, or very God of very God. He's not made, like the Arians were saying, no, he's begotten. And then you have that being of one substance with the Father, which is the famous homoousios, by whom all things were made. Again, he's not one of the things that was made. He's the one by whom everything was made. That puts him in a whole different category from anything created. Okay, then you come to a part where there's a little bit more overlap. Who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. And you notice that the Nicene Creed expands on that a little bit. Who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. 
Again, these are not contradictory expansions, but they give you a little bit more to work with. Why did Jesus do everything that's described in the Apostles' Creed? The Apostles' Creed doesn't tell you. It says that we believe in Jesus Christ, who was conceived, etc. But it doesn't tell us why all of that happened. The Nicene Creed does. It says, for us men and for our salvation. Okay, so there's a reason. There's something we're learning and a useful addition. And you notice they also have the technical language there, was incarnate. That's another um, possibly characteristic difference between the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. The Apostles' Creed tends to just use straightforward, everyday language, whereas the Nicene Creed has more theological terminology in it, like of one substance, begotten, and here incarnate, or then again that phrase, was made man. That's a little bit more technical language. Okay, so far, so good. Any, any questions, any comments? Okay. All right. Then you have in the Apostles' Creed, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. You notice that the Nicene Creed changes the order there a little bit. And was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The Apostles' Creed is maybe a little bit of a more natural order. Suffered, crucified, dead, and buried. Um, whereas the Nicene Creed sort of jumps ahead. It tells you what the outcome was. He was crucified, and then it fills in a little bit of the details along the way. It's not really a contradiction. It's just a little bit of a different approach. Um, if you were to ask me to choose, I like the Apostles' Creed better on that point. But it's not a big enough deal for anybody to have an issue with it, really, either way. Um, now, you do notice that the Apostles' Creed has something that the Nicene Creed does not. He descended into hell. And that's probably the most controversial line in the Apostles' Creed. Um, the backgrounds to the Apostles' Creed contained more than one. The main precursor of it was the Roman Baptismal Creed. And so what seems to have happened in terms of textual history is that some people said that Christ descended into hell instead of saying that he was buried. And other people said that he was buried instead of that he descended into hell. Well, then those two kind of got blended and you had both. And so now you have to give a different meaning to he descended into hell. So I'm not, I'm not going to do a whole thing on this. Um, I think we've done it before and we can do it again at some later time. But there's different ideas about that. Some people, Anglicans and Lutherans maybe, will talk about the harrowing of hell where Christ went to hell in order to triumph over everybody who was already there. Um, the Roman Catholics will sometimes speak about Christ going to hell to take away everybody who was in the limbo of the fathers, everybody who was ultimately destined for heaven but couldn't go to heaven yet because Jesus hadn't gone. So they were like in a special cushy waiting room area of hell, if you want to put it that way. And he led them out of there. But the, the prevailing, the predominant reformed interpretation is that with the juxtaposition of Barry when he descended into hell, we should understand he descended into hell as giving us the inside perspective. You know, we're told what happened to Christ. He was suffered, crucified, died, buried. What did that mean? It meant that he was enduring the wrath of God. It meant that he was in hell on the cross rather than relating that to something subsequent. It's, you know, one of those, one of those areas where the textual history makes things more complicated. We all agree that Christ was buried. And I think mostly everybody agrees that there's a, a good interpretation that you can put on the language he descended into hell. But having the two of them together creates a little bit of awkwardness. Yes, sir? Well, the catechism addresses that. Yes. It's very straightforward. Mm -hmm. You know, he's suffered his whole life with torments, but right. particularly at the end. Right. Absolutely. And that's 
Well, and that's, 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 that is a reformed view. That's that the reformed view. Yeah. yeah. It's different, of course, from the Lutheran, Anglican, or Roman Catholic view. Okay. So, moving on then. Um, the third day he rose again. Um, the Nicene Creed adds, according to the scriptures, which, of course, they're taking from Paul's summary of the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, where he mentions that these things happen according to the scriptures a couple of times. So, once again, you see the Nicene Creed expanding a little bit more and letting scripture language filter through into the creed maybe a little bit more than in the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed is about being brief and to the point, by and large. The Nicene Creed was comfortable expanding on things. He ascended into heaven, that's similar. Sits on the right hand of the Father, that's similar. Um, except that in the Apostles' Creed you have right hand of God the Father Almighty. Um, but the same person is in view of both. He shall come again with glory. It's a little bit different. Not that the Apostles' Creed denies it, just that they didn't specify it. To judge the living and the dead. And then the Nicene Creed adds, whose kingdom shall have no end. Now there's actually a story behind that. There was a theologian, and he was very opposed to the Arians. His name was Marcellus, and he was the bishop of Ancyra. And in his opposition to the Arians, in his zeal for the full deity of Christ, he made some mistakes. One of the mistakes that he made was to say that the Son and the Holy Spirit didn't really emerge into distinct being except in terms of redemption and sanctification. So the teaching was that, in a sense, the Son and Spirit were temporary forms of God that would cease when God no longer had a use for them. Well, you talk about out of the frying pan into the fire. The way he chose to express that teaching was by saying that Christ's kingdom would come to an end. So what did they do at the Council of Nicaea? They put in there, whose kingdom shall have no end? To make it very clear that even though they were anti-Arian and Marcellus of Ancyra was anti-Arian, the Nicene people were not Marcellian. Clear enough? Okay. So then we come to the third article. I believe in the Holy Ghost. I believe in the Holy Spirit. And here again you see there's a lot of expansion. And this one, you might remember, we talked about in the original form of the creed as it came out of the Council of Nicaea, both just said this. I believe in the Holy Spirit. And it stopped. But the Nicene Creed was expanded at Constantinople to say more about the Spirit because for the years in between there was a lot of argument and controversy about the doctrine of the person and work of the Holy Spirit. So they clarify who they believe the Holy Spirit to be. The Lord and giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and the Son of course is the famous and controversial addition made by the Council of Toledo in 589 and championed later by the great emperor Charlemagne. Uh, it was intended as a response to some Arianism, a form of Arianism that was lingering in the West, where because they were still denying the true and full deity of Christ, they said, what's the best way we can say that Christ is truly God? How can we unmask them now? And so in order to unmask them, they taught that the spirit proceeded also from the Son. Now, doctrinally, this was not an innovation. Athanasius taught this. Others taught this. I believe it's well confirmable by Scripture. But constitutionally, if you think about it in those terms, for a regional synod in Toledo, Spain, to add a line to the Nicene Creed, which is supposed to be for the whole empire, without asking other people, you can understand why that created some tensions and hurt feelings, which ultimately re resulted in the church splitting into east and west in the year 1054. But that's a long way to go. So we believe, though the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and from the Son, I'm not taking away from that at all, and I'm glad it's in the creed, but the way it got there was a little questionable, a little iffy. Okay. 
And then you notice this, which really defends the deity of the Spirit, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified. And that was one of the main points of Basil of Caesarea, one of the great defenders of the deity of the Holy Spirit. People were objecting to the way the Holy Spirit was included in the benediction and the doxology and things of that nature in the service. Because it meant that he is truly God. I mean, you've got a dilemma there. If I pronounce the benediction and it's the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, I've pronounced one blessing that's coming to you from three divine persons. If the Holy Spirit isn't God, he shouldn't be in the benediction. We don't add anybody who's not God into the benediction. We're not including any of our great heroes of the faith. I mean, can you imagine the reaction if I blessed you in the name of the Father, the Son, and Calvin and Luther? Or Mary. You, or Mary. I'd rightly get some things thrown at me, either in the pulpit or as soon as I got down. Well, that's what Basil is seeing in Scripture. He's like, no, we have to worship the Holy Spirit, which means the Holy Spirit has to be God. Otherwise, it would be wrong to worship and glorify him together with Father and Son. And then they just add a line about the work of the Spirit that he spoke by the prophets. Well, then you come to the rest of this. Um, the Holy Catholic Church, you notice, it's very similar, except that the Nicene Creed adds apostolic. One holy Catholic and apostolic church. When it says the Holy Catholic Church in the Apostles' Creed, I think the idea of one is kind of taken for granted. And the Nicene Creed spells that out. And the Nicene Creed adds that it has to be the apostolic church. Now, this is an area, I know we've addressed it before, but just quickly here. Of course, when people hear this article in our creed, especially if they're visitors who haven't been before and don't have a Reformed background, that is one of the questions that come up. Wait, 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 are you guys Catholics? Which, for anybody who was actually from a Catholic background, probably sounds like a ridiculous question, right? because our form of service and our building architecture and even the plainness of our sanctuary is very different from a Roman Catholic church. But they hear that, that word and they don't know what it means and so they think, wait, is that what you're saying? No, it isn't. The Roman Catholic church fails to meet the criteria here, because the church is supposed to be holy and apostolic. Now, I understand, there's sin in every community. No group of sinners is as good as they're supposed to be. But when you make unholiness the law of the land, okay, that's, there's a difference between having a standard and failing to meet it perfectly, <coughs> and then changing that standard to be something unrighteous. And my claim is that in parts of their theology, parts of their teaching, and parts even of their pastoral manuals for the priests, the Roman Catholic Church has changed the standard to be something evil, not just that they're failing to live up to everything they should. But they also fail the test of apostolic. Now, the way they claim to be apostolic is they say, look, we can point back to the line of bishops. We have a list that goes from Peter to Francis. No breaks, no interruptions, one bishop to another. We're apostolic because we were founded by an apostle. And to that I say, okay, assuming for the sake of argument, which is not what scripture seems to indicate about the history of the church in Rome, but assuming for the sake of argument that it was founded by Peter or by Peter and by Paul, as they sometimes claim, what good does it do to say we have a historical connection if the apostles themselves wouldn't recognize the church when they walked in? If the preaching and the ritual and everything else wouldn't measure up to their standards? So think about what would happen if Paul were in St. Peter's Square one of these days when the Pope comes out to give one of his little homilies and the Pope
Pope gives a talk about the racial injustice of global warming. <laughs> Would Paul recognize that as something that he taught in Romans or Corinthians or Galatians or Ephesians or Philippians or Colossians or Thessalonians or Philemon or Timothy or Titus? You know the answer to that. So what good does it do to be historically apostolic? Even that is a disputed claim, but forget that for a moment. What good does it do to be historically apostolic if doctrinally you're non apostolic? That's the real criticism. And that's much, I mean, we can argue about the history, but the doctrinal part of it is much more important than the history. Who can claim to be an apostolic church? Churches that teach what the apostles taught. That's way more important than the sequence of ordinations. Okay, uh, any questions, comments on that? If not, we can move on. Is there, <clears throat> is there a reason why we chose uh, the uh, Holy Catholic Church or the Holy Universal Church? Is that? Uh, you know, Catholic technically means according to the whole. And so I like the way that our standards reflect that, but from the beginning to the end of the world. In other words, it's not just that the church is one and holy through space, but it's also one and holy through time as well. There's one God. And so the Catholic Church is the church according to the whole, according to the whole of God's purpose, according to the whole of Christ's redemption, according to what God has in mind for the completion and fullness of the church. <coughs> in the age to come. And universal, you know, you could explain universal to mean that um, and to include that, but just when you say universal, people tend to think more of space than of space and time. So I think that's the value of having Catholic there. And, and the other thing is, if you surrender the word to the Catholics, you, it might sound like you're giving up your title, right? And we don't want to do that. Um, we don't want to let them have the word just because they've been using it when it's a good word that describes us as well. Okay. Um, and then you notice that um, the Nicene Creed expands a little bit. Or what, well, I guess the Apostles' Creed, first of all, says the communion of saints, which that does not appear in the Nicene Creed. And... This is one reason why I wouldn't be happy if we only recited the Nicene Creed. I think it's important to have that in there. It helps to expand exactly what we were just talking about. What is the true idea of the Catholic Church? Well, it's Hebrews 12 is the true idea, where we're told that we've not come into Mount Zion, but we've come to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. We've come to an innumerable company of angels. We've come to the spirits of just men made perfect, to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. In other words, when we worship God together, when we gather as a body to worship God, it's not our little congregation all by itself. In the spirit, we're coming to the whole congregation, to the Catholic church, whether it's in heaven or on earth. The spirits of just men made perfect. What do you think that is? That's the people who have already died. We're joined to them. That's one of the values of worship, and that's why worshiping at home, worshiping with your family, cannot fully replace assembling with the saints. Because it's in those moments of corporate worship that we most fully come to the heavenly Jerusalem that we're joined with Abraham and all his spiritual children in worshiping God together. The communion of saints is a wonderful thing. Of course, it also you know, has the practical implications that we should know about one another's concerns, that we should pray for one another, that we should help and support one another, that we should exhort one another daily, as it says in Hebrews, while well, it is called today, lest any of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We need one another. It's not just that the pastor has to tell you, hey, you made a mistake, or 
or that the elders tell me, hey, that was not a good thing to have said, or whatever. It's that all of us are up in one another's business, so to speak. We're all exhorting, encouraging, praying, helping. It's a real community. It's supposed to be. Anyway, um, as you can tell, I have thought about preaching a sermon on that doctrine before. Although I don't think I ever have. Okay, so that's an important thing to have, and that's an important element that is missing from the Nicene Creed. I mean, you could draw it out from the unity of the one holy Catholic apostolic church, but um, the Apostles' Creed makes it clearer. But then you notice there is this difference. The Nicene Creed incorporates baptism. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, whereas the Apostles' Creed says the forgiveness of sins. Again, the Nicene Creed is using scriptural language. In this case, it's drawn from Ephesians and from Acts chapter 2. But the idea is not that baptism secures or that baptism applies the forgiveness of sins. But just as in the case of John the Baptist, why were people baptized? Well, they were baptized with a baptism of repentance. They acknowledged their need of forgiveness and cleansing. And baptism was God's word of promise that he has forgiven, that he is at work cleansing. So baptism is associated with the remission of sins, but not because baptism is how we get it. Baptism is how we acknowledge that we need it, and baptism is how God promises to give that. Um, forgiveness of sins. Remission and forgiveness are, are very similar ideas. I don't think that's probably a difference worth highlighting in too much detail. Um, and then the real difference in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting versus I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Well, you can see the synonyms there, the dead versus the body. That was actually quite a challenging doctrine at the time. Um, some people have argued pretty recently that to a Greek-speaking audience, this would have come across like saying, I believe in the resurrection of the corpse, which doesn't sound as nice as the resurrection of the body, does it? But that's the point of resurrection, that what you have is not a corpse anymore. It was, but now it isn't. That's kind of the point. And so the resurrection of the body is, for, for Greek speakers, was a very forceful way of emphasizing the reality, the genuineness of the resurrection. And life everlasting, life of the world to come, I mean, you can see how those are very similar ideas because the world to come doesn't end. And so what the Nicene Creed really does there is it just draws us out to state more fully, more specifically, that we look for it. This is our great hope. Yes, we believe in it, in the sense that we believe that this is a doctrine taught in Scripture. We don't just say, you know, that's going to happen. We look for it. We wait for it. We desire to come to it. We share the longing of Christ to, or the longing of Paul, excuse me, to attain to the resurrection of the dead. To Christ in his sufferings, yes, but also in his resurrection. Every Christian should be characterized by a strong and by an increasing hope for the resurrection and the life of the world to come. And just, just to finish up here, sometimes we set our hopes on things that are nearer to us, things that are smaller, things that are less important. We set our hopes on worldly success. We set our hopes on peace in the family. We set our hopes on whatever. Those little hopes can all be disappointed. We don't know what a day may bring forth. We don't know what death and disaster, calamity and war, what havoc that may wreak with what we've worked so hard to reach, what we've desired so much. And when our, if Proverbs says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. If a, if a deferred, if 
Delayed hope makes your heart sick. What does a devastated hope do? What does a hope that's been torn into little pieces and danced on over a bonfire do? It's crushing. So by way of application, let me encourage you. Set your hope on what cannot be disappointed. If you're hoping, if you're looking for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come, and war comes sweeping through California, guess what? Your hope hasn't been destroyed. It hasn't even been delayed. But your hopes with regard to your business or with regard to your family or with regard to your health or with regard to whatever probably did get ruined. There's one hope that cannot fail, and that's the hope that's founded on God's word. Look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come, and your hopes can't be disappointed. It's guaranteed by God. Questions or comments? So they were just hammering out basic uh, doctrine that we believe in. They weren't necessarily a, 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 a shield of faith countering the attack of, say, the Gnostics or the Monkness, which I know little about. Yes, um, with, with regard to the Apostles' Creed particularly, it's not so much in a polemical context. And with regard to the Nicene Creed, you had a couple of arguments going on, but a lot of the doctrines, they were just saying, this is what the church believes. It, if, if there had been that many arguments about all of these different elements, it would have been longer, because they would have had to clarify and expand and so forth. Yes. All right, well, let's close that in a word of prayer. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, for the clarity of its teaching, for how that teaching can be summarized accurately, restated clearly, and memorized, Lord, as something that we can hang our hats on. We pray that you would help us, that the doctrine, the truth, would take possession of our hearts, and that you would teach us. Oh, Lord, we would ask to be taught by your word rather than by the bitter path of disappointment. But we pray that by whatever means necessary, you would teach us to hope in your word, to desire what you say is good for us, to look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come rather than being contented, limiting our horizons to temporary, fading, and this worldly blessings. Raise our hearts to heaven in this way we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.